Hey Ecclesia, it's week three in our current sermon series called Kingdom Life. We started this series with a message called Kingdom Mindset in a Castle World. And then last week in week two, Pastor Matt talked to us about the nature of this kingdom. It's a kingdom that's commissioned to expand. And this week, we are going to be talking about a kingdom and a king that we can be proud of. So let's welcome Pastor Matt out for our week three message called Kingdom Pride. So I don't know if you're ready or not, because uh, I don't know, I, saw, I heard some excitement, but we're fixing to jump into something that's really powerful today, and you really got to be ready for it. I don't know if you are. You ever wonder if somebody's ready for something? Like you're about, something, you're about to show somebody something? Like you ever get really excited about something, you can't wait to show it to somebody, and it's like you're, you're, you're as excited as they are, and you're waiting on that reaction, but you don't know if they can handle it. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you, I'm just, I'm just going ahead and giving you a, a heads up. I got to make sure you're ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the biggest things in life is we got to be proud of something. You know what I mean? So there's the bad pride. And it's like when we have pride in ourselves, but there's the good pride. It's when you're proud of something good. So like, kind of like the word jealousy. We would all say being jealous is a bad thing, but God is a jealous God. And so we look at the context. The context is God's jealous over his church, over us. When we long for other things, he gets jealous. And so he also can be proud. In the Bible, we read about how they worship God, they adore God, and there's thankfulness for God. But there's one thing I think we're really, really kind of missing the mark on. Are we proud of God? Now let's just think about this for a second. Everybody in this room knows that feeling of wanting someone to be proud of you. Those words just make a difference. Guys, you know what I'm talking about where your dad, you just long for, or maybe you had a dad that said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, son. You did a good job. You did so good. Ladies, there's that moment you want somebody just to look at what you've done, look at what you accomplished and be proud of it. And just say, you did good. But how many times do we ever do that with God? I mean, go outside and look at the sun. He spoke that thing into existence, and it hasn't stopped yet. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I look at that, and I'm like, good job. <laughs> That's flipping awesome. You ever look at the stars at night, and you're like, good job. Take a deep breath. Good job. Yes, this is good oxygen. You know, that there's just that moment. We pray, and we're like, dear Emily, Father, God, thank you for this day. But do you ever pray and be like, you nailed it. Go God. Like you, you ever have that where there's something about us that feels like that would be kind of condescending to God. But did you know he wants you to be proud of him? Think about this. You are made in his image. And when you need someone to be proud of you, your creator is proud of what he's done. And he wants you to be proud of him. He wants you to be proud of what he accomplishes. I'm proud of Jesus. You ever stopped and thought about the humility that he showed, the obedience to the Father he showed, how long Jesus was, I mean, if you just think about this, he hasn't stopped loving us in spite of everything we've done. He hasn't given up on mankind. Have you ever stopped and just thought about how many times we give up on ourselves and, and he hasn't? And there's just, man, there's people God forgives that. I'm just kind of like, whoa, good job. Then there's myself. And I'm like, you had your work cut out with you on that one. Like, good job. But still, even as much as I'm saying this right now, there are people in this room, you're sitting here like, I don't know. Let me share with you God's heart. In the days of Samuel, so we're going to look in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was a, a priest a prophet and a judge. So he was responsible to take care of Israel. He had to judge their matters. Now Samuel was a great prophet, he was a great priest, and he was a great judge, but he wasn't a good dad. His sons did not do like he did. 
They didn't follow his ways. And he has a conversation that's going to be a tough conversation. Have you ever had somebody come to you with a tough conversation? And there's only a couple ways you can react to a tough conversation. Have you ever had a group of people come have a conversation with you? HBO a while back did a show where it was going to be intervention. And you kind of know when you've walked into an intervention. So I want you to check this out. First Samuel chapter 8. Samuel's getting up in age. He's not done a great job with his kids. Verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. If you're at work, imagine all the managers and bosses... Imagine the board, everybody's coming to you, and you walk into a room, and they just come to you. It's kind of one of those moments where you're like, oh, what's about to happen? Now, look at the first words they say to him. You're old. No conversation starts off good when the first words out of your mouth are, you're old. And the very next words that come out of their mouth, and your sons don't follow your ways. You're old, you're a bad dad, and your kids stink. There's no place good for this conversation to go. You know what I mean? They they handled this all wrong. So they come to him and they're like, now appoint for us a king to lead us. By the way, you're fired. And we want you to pick your replacement. Now the key here is in your scripture it says lead, but if you actually translate it, it's judge. Now I want you to get... Samuel's not really their leader or their judge. He just works for him. God is. But they don't want to, see, God has done all these miraculous things. He's protected them. He's fought for them. He's provided for them. And he's kept the enemies at bay. See, there are all these other nations with kings that want to overtake them and make them their slaves. Yet we tend to get frustrated with the point person because we can't really get mad at God, so we go around God. But have you ever noticed, we will surround ourselves with people that will judge us in a way that makes us feel comfortable instead of having to own up to our creator. See, God is unchanging. We can't fabricate a new God. So we try, but the truth of it is, we'd rather surround ourselves with people that'll tell us what we want to hear than to hear the truth. Mm. Say, ouch. Ouch. So here's what happens. They're saying, we want a king to judge us. We want a human. We want somebody, and it says, such as all the other nations have. We want to be like everybody else. Let's look at the other kings of the other nations. Most of these guys aren't warriors. Most of these guys aren't even good people. They're slave drivers, and they go take what they want, and they send other people to die for them. So when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord. He doesn't argue with him, fight with him, punch anybody in the face. What's he do? He prays to God. And here's what he says. And the Lord told him, and this is God's response, listen to all the people are saying to you. Listen to what they're saying to you. It's not you they've rejected. Samuel, you're taking this personal, buddy. It's not you they're rejecting. They've rejected me as their king. But they're they're careful not to say that. They're making it about Samuel. They're still the Jewish people. They're still, well, they're not Jewish yet. That name hasn't been given to them. They're still the Israelites at this point. They're still religious. They still worship him. They still have sacrifices to him. They still do all the things they're prescribed to do, just not well. But it's easier to come against Samuel than it is God because then we can get a king who will tell us what we want to hear and we can, we can be rebellious but not feel like we're rebellious. He said, they rejected me as their king. And then look at God's heart here. Just a picture in this moment. We have the creator of everything that's our God and our king and our judge and he chose us. But we want someone else. What we just said without saying is we're ashamed of him. We want somebody we can be proud of. And here's God's heart, as they've done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day. Forsaking me and serving other gods, so they're doing to you. Now listen to them. God's saying, let them do it. Give them what they want. See, God has this thing called free will. He gives us. And you ever realize we get mad? Like, parents, have y'all ever had a moment where you can't do anything right? Just a few of us? The rest of y'all are just killing it. Y'all should write books. 
but have you ever had that moment to where you parent one way and they're unhappy, then you give them something they want and they're still unhappy, and when what they want goes south, then it's your fault? So God says, man, I, they, they, listen to them, but warn them. Sometimes parents, we warn them. Warn them and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And he goes into this. And so God's dealing with this rejection, yet he's still compassionate about the people. He's like, he wants to warn them. Parents, you're probably the only people that can understand this. You try to do the best with your kids, and then they get older, and they're going to make decisions. And it doesn't matter what you say. It's you they don't want to hear. And so they're going to do something. And you're like, you don't understand. I've been there a hundred times. I've gone through it myself. This is going to end badly. Let me tell you the ways this could go wrong. Have you ever tried to show somebody something that's going to go wrong, and they just won't listen? So God is saying, solemnly warn them, he's going to come in. He's not fighting your battles for you. He's going to make your sons fight his battles. He's not going to protect you. He's going to protect himself. He's going to take your best land. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your sons, and they're going to work in the gardens that he takes from you, and they'll be his servants. He's going to take your daughters, and they're going to make perfume for him and draw baths for him and bathe him. Where do you think his concubines will come from? Think about what you're saying before you choose this. So Samuel goes and he tells them. Verse 19, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. Check out the exclamation point after the word no. No! You ever be in Walmart and watch that kid with their parents? No! I'd be like, taking my own belt off. I'd be like, here, here, here. Fix that. I don't know what's wrong with them. You ain't never beat that tail before. That's what's wrong with them. That kid wasn't scared to say no to you. That's what's wrong to them. I don't don't want to quelch their spirit. That spirit needs to be driven out. We want a king over us. We want a king. No. Then we'll be like all the other nations. We'll have, with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Hey, ain't y'all ever seen a politician go to war for you? you ever, uh, seriously, have you ever seen uh, anybody in your life that is elected as a leader that's sitting there saying, wait, 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 wait. Not only do we have national crisis, but I believe Jonathan Smith in Horry County is having an issue. I need to go to his boss today. Doesn't work like that, does it? I don't even know who you are. But he's going to fight our battles. He's, it's our man. This is what's going to save us. You got God Almighty as your person. He is your king. He's your Lord, and he loves you and knows every hair on your head. Yet we put our faith in people who don't even know your zip code. They wanted somebody they could be proud of. Yet they couldn't be proud of the one they had. Let me tell you all a story, man. Because I'm proud of my Savior, Jesus, of everything he did. And he's not, he's not just my Savior. He's my King, and he's patient. But let me tell you a story. See, I, I got a flaw. Man, my favorite thing growing up was action movies. I had to sneak and watch them because my dad wouldn't let me because the language in them. You know what I'm talking about? Don't y'all act holy on me. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Man, and, and my favorites, my favorites were Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Chuck Norris, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. I ain't ashamed of it. Y'all loved him too when it was the 90s. Don't act like that. Ain't nobody in there. He could do a butterfly kick in the air and split and kick three people at the same time and not rip his britches. There was one movie. I'm not condoning this movie, okay? I I, I would not recommend this movie. Um, The language is heavy in it, but there's this movie called Lionheart. Lionheart to me, man. Bro, I'm going to tell you, this, this, this scene changed my life. See, see, it's like every Van Damme movie. He's running from the military, and he's going to do something honorable. And, and the crazy thing is, he has a brother that's dishonorable, and I don't know if he died. It's been a long time, but something happened. He disappeared from the picture, and he's got a little girl, and he's got a wife, and Van Damme has to go take care of them. They're, they're doing bad. They need someone to provide for them, to give them financial assistance and a male figure in the home, and so Van Damme leaves everything to go take care of them, and, and, and times are tough. I mean, we've got a tough economy right now, so we get it. Times are tough. Work's hard. And the only job he can find, and y'all know, men, y'all know what this is like. The only job he can find is is an underground fight network. Don't you hate it when that happens? Like McDonald's ain't hiring, so I guess I have to go fight underground 
because that's the only thing I'm equipped to do. And so, so he goes, he, he, he starts these underground fights and he finds this guy and this guy comes up to him and he kind of talking him through it. And he's this, this, this hustler that gambles and stuff. And throughout this, he's winning and this guy's making money. And this lady that bets on these underground fights, she, she finds him and she tries to take him in. And then sooner or later, she's becoming corrupt. And they want to they wanna win a lot of money. So there's this guy called Attila. And he's the final guy. It's like the final boss he has to fight. The head of this fight thing. And so they're going to set up this fight. But they want Van Damme to lose. So they jump him. And he gets his ribs all jacked up. And he's all messed up and stuff. And everybody thinks he's not going to make it. By this time, the military finds him. And he's got this last fight. And for some reason, the military is willing to forego everything to let him fight this fight. Y'all ever realize, like, when you have a warrant out for you and they're coming to arrest you, but you need to finish something before they take you in. That's how that works, right? Um, so he's sitting here, he's getting ready to get in this fight, and he comes out, and he's, he's injured, but he's hiding it. Y'all know how Van Damme always pulls his britches up to here? So he walks like he's got that ultimate wedgie, and he's kind of coming in, but he's favoring this side, and he gets into the fight, and he, he's just messing Attila up. Uh, Attila looks like Brandon. And Van Damme, he's like David and Goliath, man. And so they get in this fight, and then Attila gets this one shot to his rib. And he sees that rib's injured. And so he just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming on that rib. He's bam, bam, bam. And Van Damme gets, t- he's taken down. He's like, oh, because he always has to get beat first, right? He's on the ground, and his buddy, the guy that's been his promoter, comes up to him. He's like, hey, man, it's okay. It's okay. You're beat. You're done. Just give up. And he's like, no. No, and he looks over, he sees this girl that he thought was trying to help him, and it hits him. That's who jumped me. That's all this was. She bet against me. Have you ever had somebody bet against you? You ever have somebody that, if they just believed in you a little bit longer, but instead they went another route? Anybody ever feel that? Like, come on, man, just have some faith. Just, just know my character. Just, just trust me for a second. Why would you, why would you change? And so, so he's sitting here, he's down, and it's, it's in his head. It's messing with him. He gets back up, and he's upset. And he goes back into the fight, and Attila's still, bam, bam, just taking that rib out. And he gets him back down. This time, I mean, he is whooped. He's beat. He's bleeding everywhere. And he's laying on the ground, and his buddy comes up to him. He's like, it's okay. It's okay. Just give in. Just quit, man. You're done. And now he's starting to say this. You can't win. He said, I have to. I've got to do this for my family. I've got to do this for my family. And that guy gets to him. He says, it's okay, man. You can't win. You'll be financially okay. We're okay. We're going to win. Just quit. And it connects. We bet everything. How are we going to be okay? You never could have won, man. There's no way you could have won this fight. He looks at him and says, you bet against me. He says, there's no way you could have won. Just quit. And I love this moment because this moment's a life-changing moment. As Van Damme starts shaking. You know what I'm talking about? He's down on the ground. Now he's shaking. He's like having a convulsion. Sweat's coming off his face. And he goes, wrong bet. And he gets up and everybody's like, Wah! He comes up, and he does it. He does it. That one thing you've been waiting for, he jumps in the air and does a split, and like, whoop, wow! Kicks my man. My man goes over the rail. He comes over the rail. He's wiping the guy out. Bam, 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 bam. He's like, ah! I'm sitting there, like popcorn going like this. In the end, everything's okay. He wins, but there's one piece of it that could get lost really easy. He's okay because he took what he had and he bet on himself. Even when nobody else around him bet on him, he bet on himself. See, here's the reason I want to tell you that story because I've got a savior named Jesus who would understand what it was for everyone around him to bet against him, but he never stopped betting on himself. All right, let me, let, me, let me just jump into this with you guys. I'm gonna read to you the gospel context of Jesus, and I've taken all the gospels and put it together so we can see it clearly, so that we can see it as one story, one, one narrative over it. And I want you to picture this. Jesus came the whole time, and people would love him and praise him and follow him, and we've talked about that. But throughout his whole, whole ministry, people would mock him, and they would laugh at him, and they would not believe in him. And the Bible says people were ashamed of him and they despised him and rejected him. 
when he raised a young girl to life that was dead, if you read, the people were all around him mocking him and laughing and sneering. He was scoffed at nearly every time he performed a miracle and loved those who were mistreated. He was mocked during his trial and crucifixion. Matter of fact, he prophesied what would happen in Matthew 20, 19, Mark 10, 34, Luke 18, 32. These are the words he said, I will be mocked, scourged, crucified, spat on, and killed. And even in this moment, his own disciples were like, no, that's not what we want. This can't happen to you. You're not gonna die. And Jesus, I love this point. Jesus has this moment where they're all not believing in what he came for. They don't, want, they don't want a king of glory. They don't understand what glory is. And Jesus says these words, but in three days, I'll rise. I'll get back up. They're going to try and beat me, and they're going to try and crush me, and they're going to get me down to the ground. And there's going to be some of y'all there sitting there saying, just give up. You never could have won. Don't make the wrong bet, because I always get back up. I will win. See, that's the thing. Listen to this. We're going to look through Jesus' last few moments. Matthew 27. See, they brought him before Pilate and the religious leaders that should have known who he was bring him. And Pilate's like, look, man, I I don't want nothing to do with this guy. Like, this is jacked up. Y'all are all messed up. This is supposed to be your king. And y'all are bringing him to me. And he says, this Passover, I can release a prisoner. So I'll tell you what. I'll just let Jesus go. They're like, No. He's like, you know what, man? I'm going to make this easy for you. I got, I got this guy that's a murderer over here named Barabbas. I can release Barabbas to you, or I can release Jesus. Let's make it like that. I don't want to kill this guy, so I can release you a murderer, or I can release to you Jesus. But the chief priests and the elders, who were the ones that came to Samuel? Who were the ones that said he wasn't good enough? Who were the ones that said God wasn't good enough? The elders, chief priests, those officials that everyone looked up to. And the the crowd asked for Barabbas. So he says, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas! Can you imagine that moment where you're sitting there like, seriously? Seriously? What shall I do then with Jesus who's called the Messiah? Like, don't think God will not make it clear. You got to reject constantly to reject the truth. They answered, now check this out. They could have said, put him in jail. They could have said, beat him. They could have said anything they wanted. Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? But they got louder. Crucify him. Now, maybe you're wondering why they wanted him crucified. Because they believed anybody that was nailed to wood was cursed by God. And they wanted the people to see. See, we will fabricate curses and put them on people but they didn't know Jesus had already seen this he'd already planned this he planned to embrace the cross when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but instead an uproar was starting he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd I'm innocent of this man's blood he said it's your responsibility in that moment again they could have sat there and said well we're religious people we we don't need but check out what they said Check out this moment. His blood is on us, and then look what they said, and on our children. See, here's the thing. We take our children when we're rebellious, and we don't think of the consequences on them, but we willingly throw them into it. You know why I'm proud of my Savior? Because even when people curse their kids, he doesn't give up on their kids. Then they released Barabbas and said to to them, and he had Jesus flogged. That's his flesh being beaten off of his back and handed him over to be crucified. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. Now at this point, he has had his flesh beaten and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Now imagine as you've got open wounds all over your back the blood starts to coagulate and it starts to scab. But when, if you ever had a scrape on your leg and it sticks to your pants, so they wrap him in a robe and they put it around him and as it's coagulating, it's sticking. And they then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Notice the whole time they're painting the picture of him being the king, the king that is being rejected. Then they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. Hail the 
king of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on. Now, I don't want you to just see they took a robe off. They're ripping this robe off of his scabbed body, and it's ripping those wounds open as they put these nasty clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking him and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now here's Jesus, the Savior of the world, the child of God. And his friends aren't even there to pick up a cross when it's too heavy for him anymore in his physical flesh. And they have to make a stranger grab it and carry it. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. Bitter, nasty gall. After tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written charge against him. Here was Jesus' charge. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Now, they divide his clothes after this and gamble, but I want you to get this. Jesus isn't just chilling on some cross. At this point, his back's been beaten. He is naked. And he's mocked and he's ridiculed. And as he's here, there is a spike between his feet that are piercing his feet and all of his body weight's on that. There are spikes in his arms and all of his body weight is hanging on that. And his back is raw and beaten. And so there's this, it's not like they went to Home Depot and built a cross. This is rough cut wood. And so in order for him to speak, he has to breathe. And in order for him to breathe, he has to push against the spike in his feet and pull on the spikes in his wrist and drag his body up this cross just to get breath to speak. And I want you to see the power of what he is going through that to say. Father, Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He could have in that moment said, I'm done. Forget them. They don't care about me. <laughs> Give them Caesar. But he doesn't. I don't know about you, but I'm so proud. Take me out of the equation. Could you imagine someone so loving that in that place they would endure that just to say those words? Can you be proud of him? Can you just take a moment and be proud of him? People stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. You ever realize that's our way? Like, if he's so good, let's pull every rug out from underneath him and cause every conflict we can. And then let's sit back and see if God's in it. Let me show you another thing. If he's the son of God, if he is, y'all know whose verbology that is, whose phraseology that is? Let's go back to Jesus' first temptation with Satan where he's in the wilderness. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself off and see if his angels don't rescue you. There's somebody in this story that's not throwing his name here that is manipulating the religious people. If you are, that's a mockery and torment in itself. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and his left, so they put him in the company of corruption. Those who passed by, this is just the public, hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross, if you are the son of God. In the same way, chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He tried, notice we want God to do what we want him to do in order to prove himself. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. Because he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the two rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And I want you to get this, Jesus is one more time. He's pulling against that cross. He's pulling against those spikes. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so many Christians today want to say, oh man, he, he lost faith. Not true at all. 
Let me tell you what he just said there. Psalm 22 starts with those words. And it was David's words as he was reacting to what the Messiah would go through. And in those days, they didn't call it Psalm 22. They called it by the first words of the psalm. And so this was a prophetic message they had passed down generationally so everyone would know it. So Jesus isn't saying, God, you've forsaken me. He's saying the very scripture that you hold on to is happening right in front of you. Open your eyes and see how much I love you. When they heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar. Why vinegar? Have you ever got vinegar in a cut and that vinegar is going to run all over his body? And he said, now leave him alone and see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. See, we look at that and we think he's defeated. You can't win. Just give up. Just let us have our way. Just give up. Just... You can't win. You never could have. See, we see Jesus defeated, but let me tell you what really happened. Jesus just got up. He just got up. He didn't give up his spirit like he's done. He separated from the flesh that was fighting a battle here to go in the spirit to fight the next battle. And that battle is so much more intense. See, he, what he had to die to be the sacrifice for our sins. So when he says, I give up my spirit, he wasn't like, I'm done. When he said, I give up my spirit, he's like, oh, it's on now. And so he breathed his last, and when he breathed his last, he went into the eternal conflict of overcoming sin and death because he has to, to resurrect, to bring about life. And so Jesus gives it up, and people are sitting there, and they're walking around, and they're glorifying themselves. Man, we did it, we did it, but what they don't understand is wrong bet. Wrong bet. In that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Let me tell you something. See, when you think you beat Jesus, when you think we win, when we get to this place to where the world thinks they can stop what the Spirit of God is doing and they may revel in it for a little bit, you don't understand what's really happening because they only see with flesh. The Spirit goes, the temple was torn, the temple's curtains was ripped in two, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. When Jesus had resurrected, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared to many people. Bro, if there's ever a flying helicopter kick to death's face, it's when the earth starts trembling and death is so whooped by him that dead people start getting up. And the centurion who had been standing there guarding was so terrified at what happened that he said, surely he was the son of God. Ah, man. Can we be so proud of Jesus that we can live in a way to where people see our lives, they say, surely he's the son of God. I mean, we go to church, man. Are we so proud of Jesus that we, we drag people with us? I mean, the thing is, I don't want to drag nobody. My dad told me when I was a young boy, he caught me messing up. My dad reached over when I had hair, he grabbed me by the hair of the head snatched me straight up it didn't feel good my dad looked at me and he said son I won't let you be sorry and I'll never let you go to hell I may beat you there and I may beat it out of you but you won't go there if I got anything to do with it men can you stand up for a second men in this room can you stand up don't get up like pansies get up like men do we not have enough in us to look at our friends our sons our neighbors and look somebody in the eye and say i will not let you go to hell i will not let you destroy your life there is too much for you there is too much good for you god planned too much for you he's bet on you i'm gonna bet on jesus and i'm gonna bet on you and i will not be a part of your life and watch you destroy it i've got you if i gotta drag you with me i'm gonna get you to heaven Ever since God saw grace in Noah and found favor, ever since when Satan walked into his presence and said, I've stained mankind and you ain't among them, he looks at him and says, what about Job? I'm going to stake my entire glorious reputation and celestial name on one man and I won't even tell him I did it. But I believe in man and I'll bet on mankind. When he sent his only son to come and pay the price for the very people that would crucify him, he still bet on us. He still believed in us. 
He still had hope in us. Ladies, will you stand with the men right now? Men, you want to be desirable to your ladies? Then be men of courage and men of faith. Ladies, you want your men to stand? Then show them they look good while they lift up Jesus. Encourage them. Compliment them. Be proud of them. Men, be proud of your wives. Be proud of your sons. Be proud of your daughters. Be proud of your church. But more than anything, be proud of your king. Don't be ashamed. Speak about him. Don't be scared. Tell people how good he is. Tell them what he's done and show this world we are not ashamed of our king. The world can change. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 says he chose you. He's not ashamed of you. He chose you. He chose you because he loves you. Hebrews 11 says that he has built a city where he is your God and you are his people. He built a community, a church, a body that you can be with where you can be bold and beautiful. And he's proud of you to be there. Be proud of his city. Be proud of your church. Be proud of your neighbor. Be proud of those that are in him. And let's reach every person we can. I want to share this, man. Jesus tells this parable about three servants giving bags of gold. I'm not going into the one he's ashamed of. I'm going to go into the two that multiplied right now because I think this is so important for us. Church, you need somebody to tell you they're proud of you. Maybe you're down and you got everybody telling you you're beat. Just give up. You need somebody to say they're proud of you. Keep going because there is a Savior who's in your corner and he ain't saying give up. He's saying, I got you. I got you. Come on, Lionheart. Come on, Lionheart. In that movie, the crowd started shouting, Lionheart, Lionheart. That's what God's doing right now for you. Get up. Get up. I got you. I got you. Here's the words he says to those who are faithful. Well done. Good job. My good and faithful servant, I'm proud of you. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And here's the best part. Here's the best part. The end of the movie, the credits are fixing to roll. The 80s ballad is fixing to play. Come and share your master's happiness. I'm proud of you. In front of every soul that has ever lived, God, the God of all creation is going to look at you and say, that's my girl. That's my boy. When you get up, when you've been beaten, he's sitting there saying, I got you. I'm proud of you. Just stand. Keep getting up. I got you. You can do this. In front of every angel and every demon, in front of your parents and grandparents and children, having Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, look at you and say, that's my child. I'm proud of you. Come. Come be with me. And death's gone. It's cast into a fiery lake. It's our choice, man. It's our choice. You can leave here a bunch of kittens. Or you can leave here lions. Because our king is a lion. He's called the Lion of Judah. And he's looking for his pack. Do you know what they call a pack of lions? A pride. We need kingdom pride. When you leave here today, don't leave here like scared little kittens. Leave here like lions. If something's keeping you from that, maybe you've been in a cage too long, come. We're going to sing. Men, be men. If you need to drop something, come drop it. You need to redeem something, come up here and redeem yourself with Christ. You need to submit and be born in him again. You need to be washed like our amazing brother was this morning, then do that. If you need to drop where you are and talk to him and get real with him, then do that. But don't leave here with shame. Leave here proud of your king, knowing he's proud of you, and take the pride of this kingdom out. And let's change the world. Let's do it. Let's sing. Come on, guys. We can do it. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life. I'm not ashamed of that. Ain't no man going to stand with me forever. But Jesus is my rock. He's my strength. fiercest round and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace when fears are I won't be afraid. When striving seems, I'm not going to struggle because I got comfort in my God, my, my King, own, my Savior. Here in the and I'm proud of Him. do 
it. You've got this. You can make it. The price was paid. Right where you're at, guys, in this moment, we want to welcome you to come around the Lord's table together with us as we take communion together. If you didn't get it on your way in, please signal by raising your hand and let one of our attendees know that you desire to be a part of the Lord's table and a part of the Lord's body and blood today with us. There's a lot to think about in the message that God's put before us today. And to think about how much Jesus fought through for us, how worth it each of us was for him. I wanna challenge you today to place your bets. Don't be on the wrong side of history when it comes to the one who loved you the most. Today, as we partake of the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, together, it's time for us to go all in. Stop hedging our bets. Stop holding back. Stop being reserved. And this time we do something we've never done before. We put it all on Jesus. The body for you. The blood for you. Partake with us at this time. Yeah. 